Hello and thank you for listening to the New Zion Ministries International Podcast. We are so excited to share the sermons from this year's National Convention with you. And we trust that by listening, you are blessed and inspired to become a next generation leader. I want to share with you tonight how to regain that influence. We should be the most influential people on the planet Earth because we know the most influential man. And the most influential man resides in us. Amen. Now, the greatest challenge for the new generation leaders will be to walk in the light of the glory before they plant churches. I would, love, I would love one day just to send about 10 new generation leaders into the desert. Go and stay there for six months. Encounter God. Don't come back until you've seen the bush burning. Patrick, how do you think that will be? Just give them dry bread and tell them to look for locusts and wild honey and you come back and you've, and you've seen the bush burning and then come and talk to me. I think, we, I think we, we, we've, raised up, we've raised up pussy willow men. And the first obstacle they encounter, they give up. They go back. They're not resolute in what their calling is. And don't blame the men, you blame us. You know, sometimes the men that we're raising up, they want to tell us what to do. And then we say, uh, 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 you must think about this. Will you do this for me? Go and take a week and think about it. Don't talk that rubbish to a young man. Tell him what to do, and that's finished. And that's why I think we've lost, we've lost honor. Young men don't honor men of God anymore. You know, when Samuel was coming to anoint uh, 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 one of Jesse's sons, the whole village was trembling because this prophet was coming into the town. That's how people honored men of God in those days. But I personally think we have lost it. Do you know that some men even steal their father's sheep and they couldn't start a church with their father's sheep? No honor. We've lost honor, and if you lose honor, you lose a a, a chunk of your ability to lead people. So what am I saying? Before we start a church, a new generation leader must be able to walk in the light of God. The light of God is influence. Now, Isaiah 60 I think must be the greatest challenge to every new generation leader. That before I start a church, I must arise in the light of the glory of God and I must begin, I must begin to shine. The light must come out of me. For Isaiah 60 to become a a reality, every new generation leader will have to reach a place of absolute intimacy with Jesus. This is what I'm talking about. If you have an absolute intimacy with the light, you'll radiate the light. All these lights that you see come from a source. They don't light up themselves. They are connected to a source. And I think this this is part of your whole structure of reaching that place now. I'm a new generation leader. This is who I am. I'm connected to the light. And I bring light to God's people. Amen? This is, this is going to be the great end time work of grace will be to reveal the glory of God to those who abide in the secret place. We can't carry on church like we have been carrying on church. Something supernatural has got to break forth. Do you believe that? Something supernatural must begin to take place. That when if someone walks into the house of God, they walk out saved, delivered, healed, everything. Because of the manifestation of the glory of God that's going to follow the new generation leaders. Now, I I believe when this begins to happen, Jesus is going to restore his lampstand to the church. Let's face it, we've lost the lampstand. 
And then once again, we will become the light of the world. You cannot be the light of the world without a lampstand. If you read the book of Revelation, the whole seven churches, the lampstand was withdrawn. And the world swallowed them up. There's not even a trace of one of those churches today if you go to Israel. They were swallowed up by the world. They had lost the lamp stand. Shame some of our people are just coming in now because the bus broke down. Can you give them a, just a round of applause? Can we just wait a little, just a few minutes before they sit? Just let them come and let them settle down and then we'll carry on. So this is what we, are at this time, thank you, dear, just open it for me and leave it. Jesus, restore your lampstand to your church. Now, when the lampstand is restored, we will regain the wholeness that we were created in. It's amazing the effect that light has on everything that God created. Nothing can reach maturity without the light, the, the light of the sun. If there's no light of the sun, nothing reaches maturity what God created. Now, I think it's exactly the same with us. The lampstand gives us light, and it's amazing what begins to happen. There's a restoration of everything that God had ever invested in you. It's not dead. What God put into Patrick had never died. Regardless of what happened to Patrick, where Patrick went, it never died. It's there. It's waiting for the light of Christ to illuminate and to begin to bring it forth. It's going to grow. It's gonna, this is the powerful part of salvation. Everything that he's invested in us at creation only needs a light. And when the lampstand is restored in the church, it's amazing what begins to happen in the lives of people. What is restored? People, the image that we were created in. That's, that's, what, that's, that's what God is desperate. He wants to restore that that he invested in us at creation. You are bigger than you think you are. You are stronger than you think you are. You are mightier than you think you are, but everything is locked up in you. Now, the presence of God. I think this is what I want to talk about tonight. How, how, do I, how do I restore my image? How do I get to that place where I'm, I'm, I'm original? I haven't been influenced by the world, and the world has taken me away from God, and I'm, I'm part of the image of the world now. No, I'm, I, want to, I want to be restored back to the image of God and how I was created. Now, if you're never coming to the, the light of the presence of God, that's what the presence of God is. It's like light. And I come into the presence of God, and it's amazing, slowly, Slowly, this image is restored. I love 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, and then, and then we would unveil faces. All reflect the Lord's glory. It says, of being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You notice that? It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful revelation that Paul had on what happens when I find my space in the presence of God and I go there daily. Number one, to worship him. And then number two, just to sit in his presence and love him. And it's amazing what happens. The infrastructure deep within your being is transformed. 
I believe that not one of you won't be transformed if you submit yourself to the light of his presence. Most of the problems we experience in life is because we persist in living our lives outside the presence of God. Let me tell you something, the laptop will never transform you, the TV will never transform you, your iPhone will never transform you. Switch those things off and just come into the presence of God like that. It was in the garden, they called the garden Eden, because it was full of the presence of God, and that's where God created man. God created man in the fullness of his presence. He didn't take him out of Eden. He created him in Eden. And Adam was fully established as a man in God's presence. Then he lived like the son of God. That's how Adam lived. Adam lived like the son of God. It was amazing. The word that Adam spoke changed things. I don't think it's recorded everything in the Bible of how powerful Adam was. That's why they called him the first Adam and they called Jesus the second Adam because of a similarity in their whole makeup because they were like God. How do you like, how do you like to return to that image? Hey. A lot of people say, oh, I'll return to it one day when I die. No, you want to do it now. When you die, it's a progression of that, but now, 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 now. And we spend all our lives doing all the unnecessary things that bring us into bondage, but if we could just understand, this is the simplicity of Christianity. This is simplicity. That's how Adam lived. Every day, God would come down. Does God not come down? He still comes down, even today. <laughs> he never only came down for Adam, he'll come down for every individual. If you just make space for him, and you come into his presence every day, and you say, come Lord Jesus, come. And then this whole transformation. Do you know when Satan's got you? You're just an emotional being. But it's amazing, after, after resting in God, you become a spirit being. You're not led by your emotions anymore. You're led by the spirit of God. We fail because we are led by emotions. We should use our emotions to worship God and praise him and bless him. So God is saying, come back into the garden. I'll make a garden for you. I'll invite you to come in every day. And I'll come down to you. You don't have to come to me. I'll come to you. That's how passionate God is of this whole restoration work in our lives. Amen. Amen. Now, the greatest desire this weekend must be to find your special prepared place. Amen. In the presence of God, then the recovery of your lost image will begin to take place. How many of you know that after 40 days, Moses regained his image? And when he came down to Mount Sinai, he was glowing with the glory of God. It took him 40 days. 40 days, isolated from everybody. Came down shining. I'd love this to happen. Maybe next year. Maybe the following year. And when we come to the conference, we come glowing because we come from Mount Sinai. Now, John 15, 19. It's amazing, he came to the earth to illustrate to us how to regain our image. Yes, he came to save us, yes, not just to save us, but more than that, how to regain our image. And it's amazing, if you read John 15, this powerful, powerful, powerful revelation of how, how he, he, he was born a man, born from Mary, and how he regained that image by just getting connected 
to the Father. In John 15, 19, it says, and when, when Jesus was connected to God, connected to what? Connected to the Father's vine, he said, the Son can do nothing by himself because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. You know, sometimes we make Christianity such a, 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 a highfalutin thing, like only the, only the intellectuals can reach it, or you've got to go to seminary to reach it, or you've got to have a four-year Bible knowledge to reach it, and sometimes you can four-year Bible school and you haven't reached anything. And there it, it illustrates to us, this is who I am. I was born, I was first the son of man, they called me the son of man. But it's amazing, after this, they began to call him. You know what they called him? They called him the son of God. That's why he asked Peter, Peter, who did they say they are? They, are? they didn't know. Until Peter revelled and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Why? Because this John 15, had, he has demonstrated this is how I became that. Now, trusting God for the unreachable and the impossible is our birthright. You heard that? Trusting God for the impossible and unreachable is our birthright. You can reach it. In the spirit, there's nothing impossible. Now, you must believe that God sent the Holy Spirit to assist us. To speak in tongues, yes. To cast out demons, yes. But the important recovery of who we are in God. I believe that's the greatest manifestation of the Holy Spirit is to bring us to this place of total recovery. The powerful thing. The powerful thing. You're born small, but you mustn't die small. I love what Job said, even though our beginning was small, but so great will our end be because of this discovery of the Holy Spirit leading us to recover. The process of recovery. That's why he took ordinary fishermen and he took them through the process of recovering and they became the greatest apostles that ever walked on the earth because they were totally recovered after three years and they met the Spirit. Turned the world right side up. Is that okay? This is why you spend so much money to come to the con conference. Because you want to come into this momentum. They call it a momentum of recovering who you really are. Born of God. Born of the Spirit. I could never recover fully when I was just born of flesh. <clears throat> My father and mother did a good job, but it was all flesh. But when I met with Jesus, I connected to the Spirit, and I was born of the Spirit. And then recovery began to take place of who I really am. You see, there was no preacher in my family. For three, four generations, there was no preacher. But I met him. I met Jesus. I met Jesus. That's the unreachable. It never ends. Just constant reaching out. Constant reaching out and recovering. The man of God that you are. Wow. I can't wait. That's why I'm in a hurry for this new generation to appear. I'm getting old. I don't want to see you from up there. I want to see you now here on the earth. Turning, turning things upside down. Becoming the light of the world again. Government's coming to you and inquiring what must we do. Government's coming to inquire what, where, where should they go. Imagine Ramaphosa coming to the church in Bloemfontein, coming to our convention to come and inquire how must he lead South Africa. You see, we've lost our prophetic cutting edge. We've lost it. No matter how powerful David was, he always had a prophet alongside him. And the prophets wouldn't just tell him, oh, David, God loves you, God's going to do a thing. They rebuked him. Could you write down that word recovery? I mean, the process of recovering. 
my image and likeness that was originally created. And when he created Adam, he created all of you. See, God never created one tree at a time and one bird at a time. He created a whole lot of them one time. He created you. You were there from the foundations of the earth. And what he put in Adam, he put in you. Now, how are we going to prepare the new generation for this extreme type of life and ministry in Christ Jesus? They call it an extreme type. Not an ordinary type. I go to church once a week. If I got a stomachache on a Sunday, I don't go. No. I don't get sick on a Sunday. I can get sick on a Monday, but not on a Sunday. Because I live an extreme life. See, this extreme life is going to demand that you leave and you lay down your life like the original apostles. What is, what is your life worth if you don't lay down? It's worth nothing, actually. Because you gain nothing. You can, you can hold on to your life all your life and you'll, you'll gain nothing. Number one, we must teach the new generation the value of finding rest in the secret place under the shadow of the Almighty. This is what we must teach you. We must educate you on this. Yes, you're gonna do all the other things. You're gonna take it through Bible school and all that. But if you don't do this, Bible school won't help you. You gotta go back to the original Psalm 91 and it says he who dwelleth in the secret place of the Almighty. He says of the Most High, he says he will abide where? Under. The starting point of recovery is always under. Yes, you are baptized, you went under water. That's not good enough. You got to go under the shadow of the Almighty. In other words, you got to forget about yourself for a while and begin to set your eyes on Him. It's an amazing place. Some of, you don't know where, some of you don't know where chicks come from. I know where chicks come from. I was born in a semi-farm. And these hen used to have these 10, 15 chicks. And every now and then a hawk used to come. And it would just go like this. And it would cover them in its feathers and the hawk wouldn't see them. It's an amazing thing. And that's how God is. That's how God is. He's like a big hen. And he just says, come on now. You, it's time for recovery. Come and let me hide you for a while. It's an amazing thing. This is the presence of God. It hides you. And when you come out of it, something has happened to you. You know what the word abide means? To take up residence under the shadow, the place where your recovery begins to take place. It's a shadow. How many of you know that there was a shadow that followed the, the Jewish nation out of from Egypt, right to the promised land, but they didn't re realize what it was. There was manna from heaven, and they didn't realize what it was. And after 40 years, they were still fighting with Moses. Is the church different? The main guy you box with is always the pastor. Amen? You eat him every Sunday. He's part of your three-course meal. And you eat him in front of your children. Okay, and I'm biding now. We've taught these young, these young warriors how to abide every day. Who teaches them? You, Father, because every day you have a time where you abide as a family. Okay, so you, yes, you, you, you have your quiet time, you have your altar call, your, 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 your protocol or altar call or whatever you call it, and then you, come on, let's abide. You put on the soft music in your house and you say, come on, let's abide for a while, the whole family and you teach them. You teach them the value of how it's gonna start of a recovery in your life. Even your brain that wasn't functioning is gonna be recovered and you're gonna become the most intelligent people when you begin to, it, recovery doesn't only recover your spirit, it recovers your mind, everything. I know people who are quite stupid at school and when this recovery took place, they were bright. 
That's why Mary took Jesus down to Nazareth for the purpose of him recovering the image. And after 18 years, he goes into the temple and he says, and the spirit of the Lord is now upon me. I'm fully recovered. I'm in the image of God now. I'm going to set captives free. I'm going to lose prisoners. It's under the shadow of the Almighty that the connection to Jesus takes place. The divine connection. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. That's when the, that's when the Holy Spirit brings the branch. You, and he connects you to Jesus, your vine. As he was connected to God, you are connected to him. It's going to take time. It's going to take patience, but if a child knows the value of something, it's amazing how it transforms. You've got to teach them the value of it first. You know, I was born in a Catholic church, but there were saints in the Catholic church that practiced this, and those guys knew Jehovah. They knew God. John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, If a man abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. He said, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Have you ever heard some people when you start preaching, hey, Pastor, stop preaching for 10 minutes, they're sleeping already. You're not connected. You, when you sleep, you can't receive. Jemma, Jemma, Vakka Vort, you must be awake. Punch yourself. Every time the eye wants to close, hit it. Because you can't receive when your eye closes. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So the Lord Jesus was saying to me, before you preach my word, you stay in my presence for at least an hour before you preach my word. We take the preaching of the word lightly. The preaching of the word is the most powerful, powerful tool in the, in the regeneration of a man. It's the most powerful tool. It starts the whole process of recovery. I was talk, talking to Pastor about Lucy, how he was here last, last year. And he heard... Evangelist could see preaching a sermon. He got home and he said, yes, Lord, take me. He was bent on becoming the first millionaire in Icopo. <laughs> is, that, is that going to enhance your life? Huh? You will become a millionaire if you know God anyway. I don't believe there's a poor man who, who has been through recovery and the heavens doesn't open for him. I don't believe you can still be poor once the heavens open for you. God's going to give you things you never, ever received. You never knew. See, I remember when, the, I, I, I know the times when the heavens were shut. And now Mama Rhoda. Mama Rhoda was the most thrifty wife I've ever come across. She could take a quarter chicken and make it like two chickens. We know those days. But you can't live like that all your life. Verse 7 of John 15. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you'll ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. What should the new generation ask for? Lord, restore the former glory that we were created. And every day ask him. Lord, restore the form of glory that I was created. Don't, don't say it in the toilet. Don't say it when you're in a bus. Don't say it when you're walking around. Say it when you found your secret place and you're abiding in him. Restore God. You think God won't do it? He will do it. He will do it. That's why Elisha sold his oxen. He kissed his father and mother goodbye because he knew that if you followed Elijah, the recovery would take place. Did it take place? Yes. You gotta get rid of something, you gotta lay down something. Eh? Don't hold on to things. 
Because things you will get. When God gives you things, they don't hold you. Some of the richest people are the most selfish people under creation. You know the, the place that we rented in, 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 in Cape Town? Eventually she sold it. She got about five million for it. Russell and I had painted the outside. So there were, there were two containers there. So we wanted her to, said, how much do you I asked her, won't you give us one of the containers? We painted your house. You know what she said? No, you painted it because you wanted to buy it. I'm not giving it to you. Go and suck, man. You don't realize sometimes, uh, you don't realize what the word of God says to us. If you abide, you can ask anything you want. You don't realize the time because he knows if you're abiding, you don't, you don't ask for nonsense. There's certain things you don't have to ask to God for, but the certain pearls, the things that continue this recovery in your life, those are the things you must ask for. You must ask God to save your children. You must ask God to save your grandchildren. You must ask God to save the street where you live. That's what you must ask for. You ask God for a car and you go to Epson, you've got a, a, a 50,000 rand bond to pay for the next five years. God don't give you that. You can't wait for it, and you can't put yourself in debt. Why don't you wait for the process of recovery, and God will give, give you what you desire. He said he will grant us the desires of our hearts if we learn how to abide. Are you getting the message? New generation, say yeah! Ooh, I said, so who? I'm just abiding. All of a sudden, I am reconnected to the spirit life. It's one of the most amazing things. I'm telling you guys, we were, we were connected to the world, and now all of a sudden that's broken. The umbilical cord to the world is broken, and I'm connected to a new spiritual umbilical cord. I don't need a praise team to bring the presence of God into my life. I just, I think I experience more of presence when I'm by myself in my room. And I know when things are happening, I know my wife's going to come in that room, and she's gonna, she, she knows what she's coming for. <laughs> because she knows she's coming to partake. She's my wife. She must come and partake of what God is doing in my prayer room. Why? I've got a spiritual umbilical cord connected to my navel. When you were born in the natural, had an umbilical cord. When you're born in the spirit, you have a spiritual umbilical cord that connects you. That's how you're connected to the vine, through an umbilical, a spiritual umbilical cord. And every time you want to make contact, he's there. He is there. Amen. 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 Now, I love this illustration. When Jesus was connected, what happened to him? Hebrews 1 describes it so beautiful. It says, because of this connection, Jesus became the radiance of God. An exact rep representation of the Father's being. All of a sudden, that's how Peter, James, and Joe saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's, that's, he was absolutely connected to the Father. And they saw his glory. Now, two important things that we receive when we are connected to Jesus' vine. John 17, 8 said, he said, I will give them the words you gave me. And it says, and they have accepted them. How many of you know that's the same word that God used to create the heavens and the earth? That's the same word. It's a creative word. It creates things out of nothing. I remember when I first heard it. 
And something happened in me. First time I'd been to a crazy meeting like that. And my wife wasn't even with me. Because when we first started, she used to be the four looper. <laughs> I used to follow. <laughs> you know, a lot of us men, we like to follow our wives when we first start, is it? Yeah, please, man. Thank you. This is my new armor bearer. Derek, Derek, Derek absconded to. <laughs> and so God in his mercy has given me someone new. Uh, he said, uh, I, he's, Jesus is talking to the father now at the end of his three years with his people. And he says, Father, I've given them your word. You know, Father, that word that you gave me, I've given it to them now. And he says, Father, they have accepted it. <sighs> I like to hear the story of Pastor Nicky in the way he was a shy guy running away from his father, going to work in Joburg, move far from his father. You know what brought him back? He heard the word. And little did he know what was in him. You see, he thought he's going to be a banker. He loved, he loved, Nicky thought he's going to be a millionaire. Let me bank maybe one time and own a bank. God said, you're not a banker. You're an evangelist. You're a preacher. Come on. It's powerful, he said. And, and he says, I gave them the word, and Ricky, they accepted it. How many of you are sitting here tonight? How many of you are sitting here tonight? In this whole beginning of recovery, you've got to accept the word that you hear tonight. You've got to begin to do it. It's one thing hearing it, but you've got to become a doer of that that you hear. And it's amazing what begins to happen in your life. Hearing's not good enough. You've got to do it. He said, and they have accepted it. And then he goes on to say, in verse 22 of John 17, he says, I've given them the glory you gave me, Father. Awesome, this. Awesome. Whatever God gave to Jesus, Jesus wants to give to us. He said, I've given it to them. And because I've given it to them, Father, they're going to do the greater works. Can you imagine how much greater, how much greater, how much greater work we could have done now if we had received the word and we had received the glory and we had accepted it? And I'm telling you now, once you accept the word, it's going to be a challenge. Because then you don't tell him what to do. He comes and tells you what to do. A lot of us sitting here, we'll never move out of that thing where I tell him what to do. No, you don't tell Jesus what you do. You, he tells you what you're going to do. Because he's given you his word. Amen. Amen. And because Jesus had given the apostles Everything that they needed for life and, and ministry, John made a, 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 a powerful statement in, in 1 John 4, 17, and he says, as he is, so are we. Not as he was. He says, as he is, so are we. We've received everything that he, that he is. He's given it to us. We accepted it, and we like him now. You read the story in, in the Gospel of John and how Peter, John, Peter and John are going up to the Golden Gate. They're going to pray in the book of Acts. And all of a sudden they see this beggar. They, they had seen him before and there was nothing in them and they could do nothing to him. But it's amazing that day. As he is, so were they. And they were full of the Holy Ghost. And this man asked for money and he says, I don't have money because you don't need money. You need power of God to raise you up. And it's amazing. And he says, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And this old man is so used to sitting down, he takes him by the hand. As he is, so are we. Now what Jesus sowed into the lives of the apostles he can do the same to the new generation. Otherwise, he will continue to search for life in the world. 
That's why so many of us are flying to China. We, we're going to Dubai. We're going to the Emirates. Come on. Find life, man. Find life. You might go there and you might lose your salvation, man. Africa is the best place to find life. Because we're going to be the greatest evangelists. We're going to be the greatest missionaries. We're going to be the greatest church planters, man. That's why we came to Cape Town. Because with Pastor could see we're going we're gonna to start this evangelistic drive right up to Cairo, right into Europe, right into England with this generation. Now, the fruit that we bear from Jesus, the true vine, will have the anointing and the power to start this recovery process in the new generation. It'll, it'll start it. The only thing God is asking us to do, just start it. He said, I'll bring it to completion. All I'm asking you is just to start it. Just do something. Start it. I'll bring it in. I'll bring it to com the recovery process to completion. And when we teach them how to find rest and receive from Jesus the true vine, they will begin to walk in the radiance of Christ's glory. I don't know if you ever understand what that is. It's a confidence that you have never seen men walking in before. That's why the Bible says, when the chief priests and the high priests saw the confidence in Peter, James, and John, and how they were doing things that they'd never done, then they remembered that these men had been with Jesus. Come on, people. There's a new confidence. But Hebrews says, don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Otherwise, you begin to shrink back. When you shrink back, you move back into the world. We're not of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We are part of the kingdom of God. Would someone say Amen. Come on, and this is where we're taking you into. I want to just finish off by just reading Song of Songs to you. The invitation that Jesus offered to this little girl. Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 10. And she said, my lover spoke and said. He didn't, she didn't call him Jesus. She said, my lover. He spoke and said, come with me. The winter is past. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. Wow. 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 What an invitation. Just come with me. She's saying, my lover said. Now, when the season of singing comes... It will usher in a time period of great favor on NZMI. Do you think it's going to come? It's going to come. A time of great favor. He said the season has come. And then uh, Isaiah 54 comes into operation. And it says, sing. Let's face it, we, we've been barren for years. And they say, come on, sing. Sing, O Baron. I love these young people. Huh? It's like my bones, the, the, the fire in my bones is lit up again when I see them. When I see them jumping like that. This is a new generation. They fire, but we must take this into the streets. They say, sing, O Baron. Burst into song. You know, it's one thing singing. Hey, yeah, oh my God, to thee, yeah, oh, yeah, shut up, man, you're not in yet. I, I don't, I don't listen, because they don't listen to those morbid songs. He says, burst into song. You understand, it's different. When I burst into song, my whole body is part of it. How do I get out of barrenness? It's, the, it's springtime now. The lover has called me in. I'm bursting into song. It's a sign of jubilation. It's a sign. It, you know that when you burst into song, it's like you know that you know that you know that you know God is going to come through for you. Yeah. 
Have you ever seen these lunatic soccer players when someone scores a goal and they go and kiss one another, they jump on one another's back and they, the one guy will all get on top of you. Why can't we be like that? Why can't we be so passionate about following Jesus? You watch a Boko Boko tomorrow and you see what they're going to do. Men kiss each other on the rugby field. They hold each other. You think it's a whole lot of muffies playing. Come on. Just burst into song. I want you to come tomorrow morning with this attitude. I'm coming to burst into song. I'm praising my Savior. I don't worry about who's standing next to me. And you're going to see what's going to happen. Verse 2 of Isaiah 54. And then it talks about the time of enlargement has come. And there am I. You will stretch your tent curtains wide. He says, that's not a time for building. You can't build an auditorium bigger when enlargement takes place. Brother Kutsi, come and put the tent up for us. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm talking about? We are trying to build a church in Mitchell's Plain. I don't know, my poor son Russell had been going to this and to that and this engineer. God, when you have an engineer to build a small little thing like that, I'm saying, God, yeah, we're going to build it. The thing will be too small anyway. You know when you build a thing you know in your heart, this thing will be too small. How can I build a small thing like this and God is promising me enlargement? But they say, well, it's better to have a small thing if you haven't got a big thing. That's human logic. <laughs> oh, God. I'm all that praise God that I'm born in Africa. And I thank God that I've got, I've got different... Blood, I've got white blood, I've got Zulu blood, I've got colored blood. Just imagine, you guys that are, you guys that are, 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 are white, you've got white blood in you. And all of a sudden, my Zulu blood kicks out. And then I want to... <laughs> and then my white blood comes over, and I'm quiet, you know. I don't know about the colored blood. <laughs> I won't talk about that. But what I'm trying to tell you, that come on, enter into this whole process of recovery, and then you'll reach this place of enlargement, and it's amazing what's going to happen to you. It's amazing what's going to happen to you. If you ever come to Cape Town, I would love to take you to Pastor Nikki's You've never seen anything so big. You thought uh, uh, Pastor Russell's tent was big? Not even a quarter size of that. And you know what? It gets full of people. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful atmosphere to be part of. And then, I've reached my place of enlargement. What happens? Then, the new generation church leaders will be sent out as a testimony. Then the supernatural enlargement is going to take place because our brand will be fully established. This is our brand. This is how we do church. We get connected to Jesus. And we get connected to the vine. Enlargement takes place. Once enlargement takes place, and we say, here am I, Lord. Send me. Let's get serious about serving Jesus. Because we're moving in to the most exciting times in the history of the church. If we had vision we would see the glory cloud is already coming down. The glory cloud that's bringing Jesus back to the second coming, it's already coming down. And the closer it comes to planet Earth, 
the presence of God is going to fill the earth, and then we're going to see miracles like we've never seen before. Let me finish off. Let me finish off reading Isaiah 9, 7. And the prophet said, and of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no, no what? No end. Come on, rise up now. And I want you to, I want you to, I want you to just roar. No, wait. Wait, I'll give you the signal. It must come from your gut. I told you the story of, of, of David's army. I don't know whether it's true, but I think it is true. That when he used to go out invading with his army, he had about, he had about five, six hundred men. And they used to go in front of the army, and they used to roar. And it says the mountains used to tremble, and a lot of the, arm, lot of the people would fear, and they would run away before David actually came and fought them. Come on now. When I, when I say three, just listen to the music. Do you hear it? I want to say when, when you hear that, you, your, your knees should begin to tremble. Because the presence of God is starting to move around. I always tell my people, you must activate it. Don't be like a plank in front of God's presence. Sometimes shake your head or move your just do something. Just to activate the spirit of God. Yeah, lift your hands up. That's why, that's why when, the, when you lift your hands up, you're activating the, 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 the spirit of God in your life. You're not just standing like a log. The Spirit has never entered into a log or a plank. And I want you just to have a few minutes. <sighs> come on, I believe the Spirit of God is just beginning, is beginning to move right now. You can sense it. Come on, come on, come on. Just activate it, activate it, activate it, activate it, activate it. Just activate the presence of God right now. Ha, 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 ha. Come on, come on, just say something, do something. Shout! That's it. Shout! Shout! Listen. If if the army of Moses, by one shout, could bring down the walls of Jericho, imagine when we shout to the Lord, what's going to happen? There's a Jericho that's preventing you from coming into recovery. Shout, and it'll come down. Come on, once more. Shout! Shout! Just lift your hands up. God. Sharaba! Sharaba! Shabam Dola! God said to David, when you hear the rustle, when you hear the mulberry leaves rustling, he said, you must know that I'm there. Go to war. Go to war. Go to war. You.
you'll never know the deliverance that takes place when you do that. It's like you're loosening the inside of you. And you're saying, no more! Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. And of the increase of your government and peace, there shall be no end. Have you heard it? This is the sound of the army of God. And the army of God is beginning to march. And this is the sound of war. Thank you. Thanks again for listening. If you're looking for more resources or to stay up to date with the movement, don't forget to follow us on social media or at www.newzion.church.